Welcome to Strategy Talk, where the editors of Strategy Page discuss current events with a splash of history. I'm Dan Masterson, host of Strategy Talk. With me today is the editor of Strategy Page, well-known military author and game designer, Jim Dunnigan. Also joining us is the associate editor of Strategy Page, columnist and author, Austin Bay. Welcome, Jim and Austin. Thought we'd uh, spend a little time in Afghanistan today. Uh, the, uh, the peace treaty went south really fast, didn't it, Jim? Well, it's to be expected. I mean, there's, there's some underlying information about Afghanistan, which doesn't get too much play in the media because it's discouraging. Uh, and we've been doing, we've been hammering away at this, you know, for years. Uh, first of all, Afghanistan. Uh, the Civil War that was being fought uh, in 2001. At the time, I remember the media said the Taliban rules Afghanistan. Well, they didn't. <laughs> and this was also mentioned in the news that uh, we've hooked up with the Northern Alliance. Now, at that time, we were we were covering Afghanistan on a regular basis, so I was already aware of this. And I said, what do they mean? The Taliban doesn't rule all of Afghanistan. Um, they uh, they were still trying to subdue the uh, the last groups that had refused that hadn't been defeated in the north, and of course they never did. We went in there and uh, basically brought money, brought smart bombs, uh, and basically we paid off a lot of the uh, the wavering Pushtun tribes in the south. Um, and uh, that's where we picked up Karzai, the, the, the first elected president, uh, who turned out to be a total failure because, like a lot of Pushtun politicians, he was totally corrupt. Uh, and the drug gangs found out if they offered more money than the Americans, he was their boy. Um, so to our credit, we never got into a bidding contest with the drug gangs. But that's, again, something that didn't get covered in the media. But anyway, Karzai still uh, features in the current situation because the uh, – uh, one reason why there's no uh, peace with the Taliban there is they refuse to negotiate with the government because the government is not run by the Northern Alliance. By the way, the Northern Alliance is the non Pushtun uh, portion of Afghanistan. They are 60% of the population. Uh, the uh, Pushtuns insist they're the majority, but you know they never run a proper census. But all indicators are that you know the 60-40 thing still holds um and uh a lot of the pushuns were not crazy about this this taliban nonsense because it's even more acknowledged in the pushtun territories that the afghan the Af afghan taliban are basically an arm of the pakistani army or the isi their their central intelligence agency so to speak um in fact the uh the guy who's now running the tal I mean, they have a figurehead, some some imam, you know, who's nothing. Uh, the guy who's actually running it day to day, and everybody acknowledges this, is one of the Haqqani clan. Now, the Haqqani were one of the factions during the 1990 civil war, who basically made a deal with Pakistan, and they they turn into a criminal gang which dabbles in terrorism. Sounds like some of the drug cartels down in Mexico. Um, and uh, he's they're one of the groups that his named and mentioned repeatedly by the United States and the UN as being a terrorist organization, although they're mainly gangsters. They're mostly in it for the money. Um, but they had connections in the uh, – they had long-time connections in the Taliban because basically they worked with them uh, during the, uh, the brief – the ending of the Civil War when the Taliban took over the South. Um, and they maintain those connections, but they've always been the tools of the ISI. They were, they were sort of the, the Praetorian Guard, the enforcers. Um, but they were basically allowed to make as much money as they could, and they have. Um, so in 2016, uh, Mullah Omar, who was the founding you know, guy in, in the Taliban, the first tactical and religious leader, he died. But... Uh, they didn't, well, wait, let me get my tax rate. Anyway, they, it was announced in 2016 that he had died, but they delayed and they're making the announcement until they could basically get the, uh, the ISI could get its pieces arranged so they can get a smooth transition to a, to a more 
pro-Pakistan guy. Mullah had spent, you know, the the previous uh, 15 years uh, hiding in in the sanctuary uh, in in section south of uh, Helmand Province, where most of the heroin is produced, the world supply of heroin. Um, and uh, I don't think he'd ever gone back to Afghanistan after that. Uh, in fact, most of the most of the the senior t- Afghan Taliban uh, people have ba- are basically live in uh, Quetta, uh, the uh, ba- capital of Bangladesh province, which again is just south of the uh, of uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, they basically uh, they basically helped facilitate when they had the, when they. When the, the, the word, when it was finally admitted that you know uh, Omar was uh, was dead, actually I think he died in fourteen, and it was revealed in sixteen, um, and that ticked off a lot of the Taliban. I said, what do you mean? He's our leader. You know, we were told for two years that he was incommunicado, always praying, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there was the, the excuses of wearing thin, but he was in the dirt by then, long time, uh, and that basically exacerbated the dissension within the Taliban over, you know, what direction to take. And that's when you began to hear the stories about uh, some of the Taliban are negotiating with the government. Now, this is important because this particular trend is something that still haunts the Pakistanis. They realize that some of their bought and paid for Taliban are not that crazy about being on the you know, uh, thumb of Pakistan. In fact, almost all Afghans are very hostile towards Pakistan because Pakistan has treated them like, well, like tools, you know, ever since 1948. And in, and part of the reason for that, again, we did an update yesterday on Afghanistan where this is all explained in just a couple of paragraphs or not two pages, um, that the, uh, the, the, uh, how should I put it? The majority of, of, of Pakistanis are Punjabis or from Sindhi, the two main prop, the most populous provinces, and uh, where they're they're basically Indians who who are Muslims. But the up in the northwest, you have what they call the tribal territories, and this is where two thirds of the world's Pashtuns live. Now, there's one third live in Afghanistan, where they comprise forty percent of a much smaller national population. And the rest live, and Austin's familiar with some of these guys. He's run into the Pakistani Pushtun officers. Um, they, uh, but they are, they are like 12% or something like that of the, of the Pakistani population. And they are much, 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 how should I, but much put upon minority. They're considered hillbillies, but lethal hillbillies. I mean, these are hillbillies who, you know, basically have been invading the lowlands uh, for thousands of years. Whenever they could get away with it, they would join whoever the, whether it was Tamerlane or whomever, Alexander the Great, I don't know. Uh, They would say, yeah, sure, let's go get it. I mean, let us not forget that the mountain range in in uh, in Afghanistan, it's called the Hindu Kush, which literally means death to Hindus. Now, to the Pushtuns, Hindus are all non-Pushtun, you know, lowlanders. Some of them are Muslim. In fact, most of the Pakistani Hindus, as it were, Indians or Sindhians. That's where you got India from. Uh, the first place that the overland. Uh, uh, Europeans came into was Sindhi province, and somehow that got corrupted. The their Sindhians and that AS got dropped, and they became Indians. So there you go, a little bit of trivia. Well, that's now part of Pakistan. Uh, the uh, Pakistanis made a deal with the tribal territories. They allowed them to keep their tribal laws. Uh, and they didn't try to impose national government on them. And they just hope let, let's let sleeping dogs lie. But when the when the invasion of Afghanistan came along, and the uh, the Saudis poured in billions of dollars uh, for arms and for religious schools <laughs> for re, for refugee aid, and of course these religious schools taught the hardcore um, Saudi form of Islam, which is the basis of most of your ninety percent of your Islamic terrorism in the world today. Um, the uh, the uh, Pakistani is uh, lowlanders saw an opportunity because up until then uh, most Pakistanis uh, basically followed a more moderate form of Islam, which wasn't into uh, you know uh, we rule the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, they weren't violently opposed to Christians as long as the you know Christians weren't too weak, um, and. Um, 
And uh, you still had, after 1948, a lot of hardcore uh, Muslims in Pakistan, uh, non-Pushtun, who would basically assassinate Shia and other minorities. There were several other uh, Islamic minority, you know, uh, schools of Islam, which they considered haram, you know, unclean, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, the Shia were always a big target. Uh, and when the when the Taliban took over in uh, in the mid nineties in most of in, in southern uh, Afghanistan, one thing they went after was the Hazara. That these are the basically the leftover from the Mongol invasion, a local little Mongol. Uh, but they were all Shia. Yeah, the Mongols are like that. They'll do anything to get under your skin. Um, and uh, for a long time, they were just left alone. They were just a, there were a lot of other, you know, uh, non-Hazara uh, Afghans who were Shia. And the Af- in fact, there was there were Pushtun tribes that were Shia. Um, and until the Pakistanis and the Saudis came along, you know, that was not a big deal. A- a foreigners were, although technically in Afghanistan, if you were from another tribe that was too far away, you were a foreigner. But that's another story. People forget, uh, or at least the media doesn't put this out front where it belongs, is that Afghanistan is a very tribal country. It's not really a country. In fact, for 200 years that the kingdom of Afghanistan lasted, the kingdom was a fiction. It existed mainly to keep the foreigners out. The tribes got together. They had this 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 large jirga. Jirga means a, an assembly of the elders and the leaders of the chiefs of the tribes. And they basically agreed, all right, uh, we want to keep the damn Russians and the English and God knows who else, the Iranians. Uh, back, back, in that, back then, the, the Iranians were still sort of imperial. Uh, and the British were a threat because they had they controlled uh, most of India. And the Russians, of course, you know, the great game and all that. Uh, so they said, all right, well, the Jirga will choose a king. And by, uh, by custom, they said, since so the largest uh, group in the country is, is the Pushtun, the king will always be a Pushtun. And all he does is try to get money from foreigners, uh, negotiates to keep them out, and presides over the Jirgas. Uh but he has no—he doesn't has no power. I mean, he gets money, uh, the money, any any foreign money coming in, any deals made with foreigners. Uh, the king's family took a, a a chunk, so they lived pretty well. They could put on a good show for foreigners as a as a royal family. But that was a total scam. That is not unusual in that part, throughout the Middle East. The idea of putting one tribe or group up to keep out the foreigners, and otherwise we go back to our medieval ways. Um, and uh, that fell apart in the 1970s when the Russians decided, ah, I know how to, ha- we know how to basically punish those Afghans. We'll send in communist agitators and we'll convert the gullible urban folks who have ed- been educated to become socialists and to eventually try and turn Afghanistan into a uh, communist state. Well, you know how well that worked out. Um, the Russians found out in the uh, in the seventy ninth they were being beaten so badly their their commies were basically taking such a beating. In fact, their commies were fighting each other, which is the Afghan way. But you're not supposed to do that um, if you're a true communist. Um, and of course, the Russians went in there and spent eight years spending a lot of money they didn't have and getting a lot of their people killed, uh, and then just simply pulled out. But they left behind a puppet government, so to speak, that really didn't rule much beyond, you know, uh, Kabul and a few, you know, parts of adjacent provinces. But they got money and they, um, uh, 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 Nabul, I forget, I think that was his name, who ran the, 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 uh, the state behind uh, Russian government. Uh, he basically uh, was in defensive mode because after the Russians left, the Afghans had to decide who's going to be the new ruler. Now, since this Russian puppet uh, occupied Kabul, they couldn't put the king in there. The king was in exile. Uh, and so they were, they were fighting amongst each other to decide, well, how, who's going to rule? Who's going to be the big dog? And this is where the Haqqanis and a whole bunch of other guys that are, that are, long, are still around but are basically retired you know, uh, 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 warlords. Um, they were fighting. And the Pakistanis said... This is a mess, uh, but we've got a solution because they had all these Saudi Arabian, you know, uh, 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 madrasas, religious schools, and they were mostly educating uh, refugee young uh, uh, Pushtun 
refugees from Afghanistan. And these guys were getting all fired up with the with the with the hobby rhetoric that all infidels are are, are are evil. They must be destroyed, and all Muslims who are not like us are weak and must be made right or killed. You know the usual drill you hear from ISIL or, or whoever is the most Islamic terrorist groups. You know follow this general line. Um, so the Pakistanis got the bright idea, which actually worked, was they they basically got Omar and a few other you know uh, Afghan clerics and tribal, you know, uh, worthies and they were in exile. And they said, look, uh, we're going to help you settle this mess in, in Afghanistan. We're going to form an army of students, of talibs. That's what student means. Um, and they became known as the Taliban, the army of students. Uh, and they marched into, uh, into Afghanistan and they basically came in as the righteous young students. You know, religious students who were heavily armed and they were Afghans. They knew how to fight. Um, and uh, they were basically, uh, because they had the military backing, the weapons, et cetera, et cetera, the logistical support uh, from Pakistan. Uh, something else to remember there are only two main roads into uh, Afghanistan uh, from Pakistan. There are some coming from the Soviet Union, but. Uh, <clears throat> They, you know, the Russians weren't sending any goodies down at that time. Uh, and the uh, basically the uh, Pakistanis only allowed stuff to go through that would aid their people, in this case, the Taliban. So the Taliban had an enormous advantage. They had a bunch of fanatic, you know, young guys, teenagers in their early 20s, uh, who were heavily armed. They, they were eager to fight and they were seen by most Afghans as righteous. These are righteous Islamic warriors. Afghans, even in their pre-woke state, as it were, uh, you know, they appreciated this. And this has been repeated in several other uh, Islamic countries, but that's another story. So, I mean, this is not unusual in the Islamic history. Uh, they marched in. They basically uh, defeated the factions one by one, took Kabul, and now they were in a position to form a new government. Now, the king was in exile. They weren't interested in maintaining the monarchy. The, 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 in fact, the, well, I should say the Pakistanis were not interested in restoring the Afghan monarchy because it was very independent of Pakistan, which annoyed the Pakistanis uh, no end. So here was their solution. One, they ended the violence going on in um, in uh, Afghanistan, they got their people in charge, but there was one fly in the ointment. Uh, they had not conquered all of the country. I mean, the Pakistanis could do the math themselves. They knew that over half the population uh, were not pushed in. Uh, like a lot of pushed in, they hated the Pakistani influence. They were not even mesmerized by these talibs. Uh, and the, uh, the Northern Alliance, which until the Taliban went in, were basically uh, semi, a bunch of independent warlords, you know, fighting uh, for power. I mean, there were different ethnicities. There were, there were uh, uh, Tajiks. Uh, there were, there were Turkic peoples, et cetera. And there were the Hazara. Um, but these people, they realized, you know, are, are up against the wall. So they formed the Northern Alliance, which was quite successful. But time was against them. The numbers were against them. Then the Taliban made the, oh, by the way, the Pakistanis also helped the Taliban organize the drug cartel. The uh, the Afghans had pushed the uh, the heroin business out of out of uh, uh, the tribal territories of, um, of, Afga of Pakistan in the 1980s, where it had moved after the Chinese had shut it down in Burma, the old Golden Triangle. Again, that's another story, but uh, uh, throughout the 70s, uh, most of the heroin was coming out of the northern Burma, the, the Golden Triangle. Uh, again, tribal societies up there, uh, you know, read our Burma coverage. It's an interesting story that's still going on. But anyway, most of it was moved out. It landed in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Baluchistan and, very, and it basically the tribal territories of uh, Pakistan. Pakistanis didn't want it. It was very unpopular, so they pushed it across the border. And this happened before the Russians came in. Uh, when, when the Russians came in, they basically didn't go after the drug gangs because they would cooperate with the Russians. Uh, they would even give away free samples to Russian soldiers. Well, the Russians didn't like that. Um, but the soldiers did. And uh, the Taliban, after the war was over, they turned to the drug gangs and said, all right, you guys can keep doing that stuff, uh, export most of it, and pay us a, a big tax. And, and that'll be our financial base. Um, 
And that was the beginning of the, the the relationship between the Taliban and the and the drug gangs, but in, in, and of course the Northern Alliance didn't have that. So and uh, then the the Taliban got hubris, uh, they got too full of themselves, and they started giving sanctuary uh, to uh, other Islamic terrorist groups, in particular. Al Qaeda. Now, Al Qaeda had a track record. They had they had they had the street cred, as it were, uh, in that part of the world, because they had in these in the seventies uh, and eighty. Well, mostly this in the seventies and the the eighties uh, set up the uh, the support. Uh, uh, Qaeda means the base. They had basically helped brought in the Saudi aid. Uh, Bin Laden was a Saudi. And uh, they brought in the supplies, the guns, the food, and the whatever aid for the refugees. So bin Laden had a lot of credibility with the Taliban on both sides of the border. So they couldn't really turn him down. Because at that point, he had been run out of Sudan. Uh, he had lost his, his uh, Saudi citizenship. I mean, he was you know, a pariah in most of the world. Uh, and then, boom, he lands in, um, in, uh, in Afghanistan, where he's allowed to set up camps. And of course, this is the old story. This is what brought on 9-11. Uh, we told, even even before 9-11, we were telling the Taliban, look, if you want to be you know, recognized as a country, which only a few people were doing, you got to get rid of Al-Qaeda. And of course, they couldn't really do that because they owed him a debt, a blood debt, as it were. He was there for them when the Russians invaded, and they couldn't, you know, you can see the situation they were in. So, 9-11 happens, and then in come the Americans. Now, this is not like the Russian invasion. I mean, this is something that the media got. Oh, it's another Russia invading Afghanistan. No, it is not. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, I think Al and I, and even Austin and I, were on TV. I remember back then, uh, you know, doing book for books or whatever, and we were asked about that, and we'd explain it to them, and, they, and I always got these blank stares, like they never heard this before. What is this? And nobody ever called it BS, but news directors said, no, we don't want to cover that. It's too messy. People won't understand. Whatever. Um, so the truth lay out there in, in full sight, but they never got the spotlight, never got any media coverage, but it was still there. The tribal society was fighting amongst themselves, and once we went in there with a little bit of aid, uh, and basically forced Af Pakistan to cut off their support. I mean, that, that did make the news. Well, we told Pakistan, you're either with us or you're an enemy. Uh, you want to be an enemy? And the Pakistanis conferred, and said, mm, let's do the math. No, we don't want to be an enemy. Uh, but what they did was they stole billions of dollars from us, which was supposed to be meant for fighting um, uh, terrorism. When it, a lot of it was going to support terrorism and to build up the conventional armed forces so they could basically uh, <coughs> uh, you know, threaten India. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Northern Alliance suddenly overnight became a lot more powerful, which is why the Taliban were defeated within two months. Within two months, they were fleeing across the border to their, their eventual sanctuary in Baluchistan. Uh, that was Tor, Bor, and these various other names. Some people, uh, from whomever way back then will, will recognize. Um, and, uh, and the Pakistanis, they had a plan. Says, All right. Uh, we'll take the long game. Uh, we got we got the core you know leadership out of uh, of uh, Afghanistan. Some of them went to Iran, where the Iranians had the same idea, even though they hated the Tal the Taliban big time because they were killing a lot of Shia uh, in uh, in Afghanistan while they were ruling. But they said, all right. But they basically put them in safe houses, kept them out of the the, the, the spotlight, and and told them. You're eventually going to have to be useful to us, and and the Afghan Taliban basically said, "Well, doing what? Uh, killing Westerners? Oh yeah, we can do that. Just let us know." Um, and that basically translated into going into Afghan uh, Iraq after 2003 and doing all sorts of other mischief. Again, that eventually came out as a big surprise, big headlines. Oh, who knew? Well, a lot of people knew, but nobody was really paying it much attention. The the uh, the Taliban did eventually rebuild uh, their strength because all the economic aid coming in from the West, tens of billions of dollars a year, uh, a lot, of, most of it was stolen. I mean, here, here's here's a telling, you know, anecdote which I got from a guy who got out in the '80s. He was a uh, he was a uh, officer of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the Afghan army 
trained by the Russians and what have you. And uh, he basically decided that this isn't going to last. So he got out while the getting was good. And he came to Washington where I met him. And he said he was in uh, the uh, in Kabul when the Russians rolled in, uh, when there was still when there was still, you know, a, a Afghan army and a king. Uh, and um, he uh, he was standing in the crowd as the as the Russian, you know, troops, you know, rolled by in their armored vehicles and what have you. And there was this old old guy, older guy from the country who was in on business. And he looked at that and he, he turned to me and said, look at all that loot. You know, and that's the attitude, even though it sounds suicidal and, and crazy, you know, to a Westerner. So the Afghans, you know, fighting and dying, you know, that's that was that was the way. Um, and uh, the Russians are are not an unbeatable invader. They're an ultimate source of loot. And of course, when that proved the case and the Taliban were the leaders, um, you know, the uh, when they when they basically the, the Taliban beat all the other guys and promised more loot. Uh, they said, "All right, you're you're the way to go." But when the Americans came in and the Northern Alliance triumphed, they uh, they basically had to rebuild their credibility. Now they did that. The uh, the the uh, the economy boomed since two thousand one, two thousand two, actually in Afghanistan. And the people who made the most of that were the crooked politicians, actually crooked politicians, a double entendre, uh, as it, you know, uh, it, 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 it means the same. Because in Afghanistan, if you get a high position in the government, you're expected by custom, not to mention threats of death if you don't, uh, to take care of your people. Now, that's true in other parts of the world, but it's particularly true in in Afghanistan. Uh, and Karzai, who seemed like a convenient senior, uh, uh, you know, uh, anti-Russian, anti-Taliban, you know, uh, Pushkin politician, he became our guy with the with the cute hat he was wearing and whatnot and the gift of gab he had. Uh, and he became a president, but he was a total failure because he was stealing right and left. And that, that became our criticism of him. Now, the current election... Uh, was won by a guy, another Pushtun politician, who was in exile during all this, um, Ghani. And but the guy he, he beat twice, two two times in a row, uh, in a questionable election. But they, the elections are full of uh, corruption. Uh, was was there and was was a was a was a politician, an anti karzai politician when Karzai was in office most of the for most of that period. Abdullah, and uh, and uh, he is currently uh, he the Ghazni just got uh, sworn in for his second term, and Abdullah had himself sworn in in another part of Kabul as the real president. So you got two presidents in Afghanistan right now, uh, and the uh, and this is and that's that may be one reason why the Taliban won't negotiate with the uh, with the Afghan government because they can they can honestly say well which one. Uh, but the thing is, the Taliban are still, although they're pawns of Pakistanis, they are still true blue Islamic radicals. And that means that they follow the Islamic radical playbook. This has not changed. ISIL did it. Al-Qaeda did it. And, and what it did was it took the hadith, you know, the, 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 the sections of the Quran, the Holy Scripture, that basically the checklist of how you fight for infidels, non-Muslims. And it says, basically, you lie, cheat, and steal because that's the way. Allah respects that. Allah expects you to do whatever it takes uh, to basically uh, in, and to make sure you are out on top and in control. And Westerners just have a hard time understanding this. You do not make, and that's why we had the policy if you do not negotiate with terrorists. Now, this gets warped into all sorts of different shapes, which have nothing to do with the reality of it. But the basic fact is you cannot, because a true Islamic radical will not uh, negotiate honestly uh, with you. It just isn't done. Ask Israelis. They've been trying to negotiate deals with the Pakistani uh, with the Palestinians uh, for decades, and there are moderate Palestinians because the Palestinians were never big in you know in, 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 in they were moderate. I mean, they were true moderates. They didn't want religion and government getting mixed up, which is considered somewhat uh, heretical uh, to a true you know, conservative Muslim. Uh, but the Palestinians, like most of the people in the Levant, you know, the, the descendants of the Philippines, uh, the, the Philistines, uh, you know, of, of Carthage, 
a fame than you know opponents of the Romans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, they were always the wheeler dealers, uh, and many of them remained Christian, and and their their old time religions spoke Aramaic, which is what Jesus spoke, uh, and uh, that's why that part of the world is such a mess because you got all these factions, you know, the the old versus the new. Um, and so many people are, are basically not willing to give up the the old ways, the the old old ways, uh, for this new stuff, this Islamic terrorism. Because the Islamic terrorism, for, for over a thousand years, it's been around in Islam, but it's always been looked down upon as an aberration. Uh, because again, the majority of Muslims are not into that stuff. Uh, granted, it may be in the scripture. But there's a lot of stuff in the scripture, even in, in the Christian scripture. But the the important thing is in Islam, they're the only major religion which uh, acknowledges that this can be a uh, a sanctioned way for a good Muslim to to live, uh, to defend Islam. And of course, all you got to do is create you know some reason to to defend Islam, and off you go. But for over a thousand years, uh, Muslim governments in the Middle East, including the Turks had to periodically put down uprisings by guys claiming, you know, we are the pure uh, and we want to purify this corrupt government and replace it with a corrupt religious government, which is what would happen in the future cases where it has happened, like in Iran with their religious dictatorship, which is just read the papers. Even they admit that they have corruption problems. Um, And uh, they have, and all of a sudden in the 20th century, you've got oil, You've got mass communications. You've got travel by air. Suddenly, the the the, the fanatics can can a collect a lot more money to to support the cause, and they can make war on infidels instead of each other. Now, even with that, over ninety percent of the dead during this war on terrorism, basically since the nineteen nineties, have been fellow Muslims. Uh, a point that is not lost on the Muslims, but we 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 uh, we published oh years ago surveys, opinion surveys of different Muslim countries as the as the Al Qaeda and then ISIL and whatnot came and went, and it was interesting. Whenever there was no Islamic terrorism in a Muslim country, uh, the majority of people approved of Muslims fighting the infidels, but. The minute there was a bombs going off in their country, they were down on Islamic terrorism. Interesting. Uh, and it was pretty, pretty consistent. Uh, even happened in Saudi Arabia. Al-Qaeda had a sanctuary in, in, in Saudi Arabia as long as they kept quiet, as long as their activities were only for making attacks on foreigners and not embarrassing the Saudi royal, the Saudi government. They basically, and this was happening. I mean, we admit it. I mean, most of the the nine eleven bomber the bombers uh, were were Saudis. I mean, this was said people people Americans Westerners saying, well, how can this be? What's going on? Well, it's very simple. You know, it's because of the 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 the, the religious and cultural, you know, uh, uh, milieu that these people were living in. That if you can get away with it, you go after the infidels. Well, now a lot more people could go could get away with it and went after them. Pakistan, the the army who was trying to basically run the country without being responsible for running the country, uh, this stat started in the 1950s. Uh, they basically realized in the 70s that we can use Islamic terrorism as a way to gain more power in Pakistan. This is still going on. Uh, again, it doesn't get pushed forward because in the West it's become fashionable to say, "Well, it's not Islam." Uh, you know, they're just terrorists. They're not Islamic terrorists, but that's that's wrong. <laughs> the historical record makes it very clear they are Islamic terrorists. That's their justification. That's their 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 donor and their 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 recruiting base. Uh, without that, they don't exist. And so what's going on in Afghanistan now is you have this, 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 uh, this again, a civil war between the old Northern Alliance, who don't want the drugs, don't want the Pushans, you know, telling them what to do, and don't want Pakistan telling them what to do, uh, and the, the Afghan Taliban, who are the wholly owned subsidiary of Pakistan, the Pakistani military, are basically trying to uh, arrange a deal for the Americans to get out. But now nobody knows what's really going on in Washington with this policy. I mean, it's, it's, it's politically very popular, and as far as I can tell, um, 
the, the our government, which is promised, we're really going to get out of Afghanistan, or at least try. Um, but the 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 CENTCOM, the senior commander in Afghanistan, has said publicly, if the Taliban renege, we will bomb the crap out. We will be right back there. In other words, that is the official policy now. We are not going to turn our backs and just leave and you know try and stay away because they won't leave us alone. Uh, so, I mean, uh, that has been absorbed by the Pentagon and even, even large chunks of the State Department. Uh, not the American media, but that's another story. Uh, so, what is actually going on is, yes, we are trying to get the Taliban to disgrace themselves. Well, theoretically, we, we, are, we are willing to trust the Taliban if they prove trustworthy. That is impossible. I mean, I'm telling you right now, and you can check the histories. <laughs> That's just the way it works. Ask the Israelis with the Palestinians. Uh, and uh, so we're willing to let them, you know, uh, hang themselves, as it were, to prove again and again that they cannot be trusted. And right now, the, uh, the, the February 29 uh, agreement uh, is being, you know, uh, torn to bits by the Taliban because they're, they're basically picking nits with the Afghan government. They want the Afghan government, for example, to release 5,000 uh, Taliban prisoners. It's half, it's half the Taliban uh, that are in, in jail, in Afghan jails. Uh, the Taliban government, the, 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 the real one, I mean, the Ghani government, the one that the election commission said got elected uh, uh, in the September 2019 election. It took them that long to sort that out. Uh, he has said, yes, all right, Americans are pressuring us because what we got the, the, uh, the Ghani government by is the, the foreign aid. They say, look, if we leave completely, so does all the money. Yeah, we know we'll have to eventually come back, but you will justify it. You will basically try or actually come out with some major attacks based in Afghanistan, and we're going to play that record again. And a lot of Taliban, a lot of senior uh, Afghans say, well, you know, they're kind of right. That's, they do have a pattern of doing that. Uh, you know, they make fun of we can, we can snooker the uh, Americans and the foreigners, we steal all the money and want that. But there are certain things you can depend on them to do. And they will bomb the crap out of you if you carry out a big attack, you know, and kill a lot of Westerners. So that they understand. But the Islamic fanatics don't. They said, oh, no, that's immaterial. It's like it's like a doctrinaire communist. Oh, yeah, well, we got it wrong with the uh, with the right in Russia. But give us another chance and we'll get it right next time. Uh, the Russians gave up on that. The Chinese gave up on that. The Cubans. Well, most Cubans have given up on that, but they still got a communist government down there. But that's another story. The problem is that there is not going to be any peace deal with the with the Taliban. There will be attempts. And as we've seen with the with the current one, uh, they're not going to work. And part of the reason is not just that the Taliban will not issue the order. They cannot issue the order because there are factions within the Taliban. And again, we've reported on this. I mean, these, these are reported inside of Afghanistan. It's reported inside Pakistan. There are various factions which are in opposition to the uh, the Taliban leadership in 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 uh, in Pakistan, uh, and so they will basically go out of their way to skewer any deal because they feel that any deal this this that that gets completed that gets the Americans out the uh, the Pakistani you know faction of the Afghan Taliban will get credit for it and that will just make uh, give them more power than they deserve inside of Afghanistan. So the Pakistan the Taliban are not just arguing and, and negotiating with the Americans, they're negotiating with many of their own factions. And then on top of that, they got the elected Afghan government to deal with. And uh, they say, look, we're not going to deal with them until all the Americans are gone. But if they attack the Afghan government after we go, there'd be a lot of pressure. Well, hey, you know, we're not going to go back to, uh, you know, uh, uh, 2000 and 1999 again. I mean, that's what will be brought up. Oh, that was a big mistake. Uh, I mean, like, uh, basically, we can predict the headlines, you know, before they even arrive. But uh, there is a certain method to this uh, this this uh, media service. Um, and so there is no peace in Afghanistan with the Taliban. Uh, and it's really just theater. Uh, everybody's going through 
uh, to try and negotiate. Something good may come out of it. I mean, basically, it's making the Taliban look bad uh, because they already had the internal dissension. And this may turn out to be something that will basically backfire on the Taliban big time because uh, there are a lot of other opportunities for, the, for things to backfire on them. Jim? Yeah. I'm, I've, got, I've got a slightly different take okay. on that. All right. Uh, Dan, I'm just looking at, at the time on it. And I realize I didn't, there's, Jim's covered the background in depth, giving you a, a very good uh, feel for how complex demographically uh, Afghanistan is. And remember, it's also very complex uh, in terms of terrain a, a, as well. You know, valleys where they <laughs> grow poppies as well as food and, and the mountains where uh, it's virtually impossible uh, uh, to, uh, to control uh, as a with a, a central government to control if uh, uh, tribes want to hole up in their own uh, mountain uh, mountain. Uh, vastness, if you uh, if you want, so that it's uh, if you think of it as a big Balkans or the Balkans as a, as a small Afghanistan, you've got a something of a uh, of a working analogy. But Jim is right about not trusting certain Taliban factions, but Jim, here's one of the things that's different than 2001. A lot of the old leadership is dead. It's dead uh, or. Uh, in exile, and in exile, they've been tight, uh, closely associated with the uh, Pakistani inter services intelligence, meaning the uh, uh, Pakistani uh, Pashtuns. The other change, and this has strategic effects, is that in 2001, the Taliban had a material advantage over the Northern Alliance. They had more weapons, better weapons. And they also had all these trucks, these Toyota trucks that gave them more mobility to move around and, uh, the, than the Northern Alliance. That's changed. The Northern Alliance has high quality weapons. And they also, as Jim's mentioned, what the, our, uh, the senior U.S. commander in Afghanistan says, if you guys renege, we're going to bomb you. That means that U.S. air power is actually going to be as it was, this is going to be something similar to 2001. U.S. air power would support uh, Northern Alliance forces in a, a on the on the ground battle. Now, I believe the Taliban remembers what B-52s did to them with special forces out with uh, Northern Alliance uh, uh, ground units uh, and directing uh, B-52 strikes. So there's a real. Uh, enforcement mechanism to this, uh, and I think Jim was qu quite correct in describing this uh, amorphous deal. Here's something else I've thought. Now, Jim, I, I know it's a it's a stretch, but you think think through this, th think through the description, uh, accurate description of the Taliban. There are multiple factions. There are leaders that we have talked to over the uh, over the years as you said that they're against the Pakistan uh, uh, Pashtuns they are more receptive to making some kind of deal with the United States because and to use one of the terms you uh, uh, you employed it does give them prestige it gives them prestige in a way in a way that uh, uh, Equivalent to what's going on uh, with with some of the more powerful uh, Pakistan-aligned uh, uh, Taliban uh, factions. Now, the hardcore Taliban are, as Jim described, as uh, uh, Islamic radicals. That was where they mind melded with uh, uh, Osama bin Laden and, and Al Qaeda. But this is a change from 2001 as well. <sighs> ISIL, ISIS has been defeated. Al-Qaeda has, has been smashed repeatedly. Bin Laden is dead. The number one and number two in ISIL are, uh, are dead. Uh, numerous Al-Qaeda leaders have uh, uh, gone to heaven or wherever they go after they've been killed. Uh, it's a different generation. The other issue. Now, this comes in with the corruption. Jim was talking about uh, heroin. 
Money Talks. Now, none, none of the governments, uh, such as they are in the region, and very few or anywhere around the world, with the possible exception of North Korea, wants to see heroin pushed in uh, North Korea doesn't want heroin in North Korea either, but they would like to make some money off of it. Uh, it's it is a it's it's a criminal problem. Heroin is a destructive jo- uh, drug. Nevertheless, it's a lot of money in Afghanistan, and a lot of the criminals. Jim mentioned a couple of the factions, the very various networks. They're not religiously oriented. They pay off religious groups, but they're not religiously o- o- oriented. I don't know what the deal is vis-a-vis Helmand Province heroin production, but that's also something that could be held at risk by uh, the United States. It, it, I mean, attacks on on uh, heroin pro- uh, on poppy fields uh, and the like could be done. Could be done, and what would legitimate it? Jim already laid out the legitimating factors. The Taliban uh, reneges, launches a, 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 a launches attacks, or uh, stirs trouble elsewhere. Uh, elsewhere, I'm not saying that that is some a likely likely action, but it is something that could be done as uh, uh, a, 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 as retri- retribution. And I, I will guarantee you that the uh, criminals are aware, are aware of that. They can't, in other words, they, their, their production facilities can't be protected. And, and, uh, and with, can't, can't be protected from a concentrated U.S. Uh, 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 attack on, uh, on the fields. I, I, I want to I caveat this again. I'm not saying that that's what was going to happen, but I'm just telling you it is an operational option that uh, the United States uh, United States uh, has. There's nothing to stop the U.S. from using CIA uh, drones to knock out the leadership of of uh, factions that decide to renege on the deal. Nothing. That's and also, there is this remnant. Uh, I've seen various figures, Jim. I think you you wrote something that so said there was 8,500 or 8,900 troops to be left. That's um, that's a lily pad, uh, meaning that's a place where you can u- use as a starting point uh, to uh, reinforce it if that's what you decide to do, because there. Are a number of people in Afghanistan that don't want to have anything to do with the Taliban, and when you you'll you, they're already uh, criticizing the deal and saying the United States sold them out. The view in, the, in Washington is we've been there 19 years, we have poured billions and billions of dollars in there, and a lot of it was stolen. It's time you're either going to do it yourself or you're going to lose. And there are people there, as bad as the Afghan army is, but some of the quote-unquote warlord militias in the uh, Northern Alliance that are quite capable of defending themselves, particularly if they've got uh, air support. So it's, there are, when you look at the force that can, forces that can be brought to bear, and I've primarily been military security on this, but there are also diplomatic forces sanctioning Individuals involved in the in the, uh, the, uh, the uh, drug trafficking, so that they're it's very very difficult for them to enjoy uh, the benefits, enjoy the money they make. Uh, sanctioning, uh, you know, dealing with their uh, finances as well. We've gotten much better at this. You can see that being done to Iran and North Korea, we can do it at the individual level. And I've used as an example what's uh, done to some of the leadership on both the South Sudanese government side and the South Sudan rebel rebel side. Key individuals sanctioned financially and also in in terms of of movement and U.S. influence. On uh, uh, on that is you know, we usually can get anywhere from thirty to fifty other countries to go along with us. It 
may not be absolutely enforced, but it is friction for the those who decide they're not going to cooperate with the or, or continue to honor the deal that uh, uh, they made in Afghanistan. Now, I've gone through what I see could be brought to bear or could be the context or envelope. Some of it, I know, is is part of the context for uh, uh, for the agreement. But Dan, uh, about a year ago, I was giving a talk about my uh, new book, Cocktails from Hell. And I fell in the back uh, of this. And there were about forty people. It was a a lunch uh, talk at a lunch for a uh, a, uh, a club. And the man raised his hand and he says, says to me, uh, Colonel Bay, so it tells me that the guy had prior service. And he says, what do you think about Afghanistan? And I asked him, I said, you ever serve in the military? And he says, oh, yeah. He told me later he'd been uh, in the infantry. He'd done a five-year hitch. And all right. Now I said, ever pull guard duty? <laughs> And he looks at me and he says, oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, okay, pretty boring, isn't it? Unless something happens, right? Now, is guard duty necessary? Of course it is. Sometimes you're stuck with guard duty. And I said, the Afghan situation, factional, fragmented, take a look at the terrain, take a look at the, uh, at the people. You heard Jim discuss it for 40 minutes and and plenty of uh, details and with footnote uh, footnotes on it and and this fellow he knew that and i said there's got to be some type because he 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 told me he says he 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 was ready to leave I, i said there's got to be some type of guard duty or we'll see some radical islamic faction try to use it as a base again. And that's a stabilizing force. I said, I'm sorry. That's the, that's the way I see it. Well, sure enough, out of this agreement, it may look small, but it, it, Jim, let, let me take a guess. It, it's going to be at Bagram, right? The Bagram yeah. area. Somebody, and, all right. And well, Bagram, there's two or three bases we can uh, basically lily pad. Okay. All right. See, the thing is, I've been to Bagram, what, three times, I think. And that is a huge base complex. We've really really uh, 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 enhanced it and improved it, and it's well defended. And I'll tell you, if somebody comes and fires a mortar at it, some of the lessons going on in in Iraq right now and vis-a-vis Iran, that gets around. You're going to get shot. We will shoot back. You kill an American, you wound an American, we're shooting back. Uh, And that has a deterrence factor. Now, it doesn't stop all the, all the hotheads, but it, it stops some, stops a lot, stops those who decide they want to live to be a hothead an, uh, another day. I'm, I'm, I'm being very, very basic with it and saying that we've, we've got a track record right now for shooting back rather quickly when you shoot at, uh, 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 shoot at Americans. So this is not a win. But the thing is, is to call it a defeat is a mistake as well. You could look at it and, and, and say, everybody's lost something in this. And the fact that the Taliban want to make a deal says that they realize they've lost a lot too. And they have. So uh, this is one of those, this worth coming back, I want to say in 12 to 14 months and talking about what's happened with this deal. Who knows? We may be back. We may have 25,000 troops on, uh, on, the, uh, on the ground, or we may have 7,500 hanging out at these uh, lily, pad, uh, lily pad bases. I want, I want to add two other things. Jim talked about the old golden triangle. Uh, about a month ago, <laughs> Jim, I looked at the 1985 first edition of the Quick and Dirty Guide to War, and you know we have a chapter in there on Burma. You know, Burma's Bitter Road, which was uh, a, a, really most of that chapter, was about Golden Triangle, uh, uh, heroin, 
drug uh, 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 drug gangs. And one of the sources of the development of that uh, drug uh, business in uh, Burma, Laos, and the uh, northwestern border of uh, of Thailand was the nationalist Chinese Yunnan army that retreated into into Burma uh, after the uh, communist victory in 1949. And you had a cadre of, uh, I'm not sure how big it was, it wasn't th- 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 uh, uh, that large, several thousands, six or seven 7,000 troops, let's, uh, let, let's say. They had nothing else to do other than you know, their, their skills were uh, as soldiers. They're cut off, and what do they do? They set up a kind of a jungle duchy, and they got to find a way to make money. And they're the poppies. So they yeah. were, they were they, one they, they, they had one advantage. One of the major tribes up there in northern Burma are the Wa, and they are ethnically Chinese. Uh, and they, they, you know, they basically trade with China, and they were the they were the basis of the ancient, you know, 18th, 17th, 18th century uh, opium trade, opium, which, yeah, which was which was outlawed by uh, by the imperial government because it was reaching epidemic proportions among the upper class. Sound familiar? But uh, all right, there was money in it. The, the Karen tribe got into it too. So uh, again, this was another. There's there are differences, but th- there's. The, but there, it's a, it's an analog, and I, I was when I looked at that chapter, I thought, yeah, and now now it's moved to uh, largely to uh, to Afghanistan. The other thing, Jim, on the name of uh, of India, Arab traders from the you know the what were once called the Trucial States, but you know what were the uh, the uh, Sinbad the Sailor. <laughs> Uh, era of uh, Arab traders w- were aware of the of the uh, Indians that lived on the Indus River. Now, which flows down, you know, through uh, pa- Pakistan. There's only a tiny little sliver of the Indus that is now in contemporary India. It's up by the the uh, glacier, Siachen uh, Glacier. Most of the Indus River flows through. Uh, uh, of Pakistan, so there's there's as, as the origin of the of the, the name of India, depending on how that river was pronounced, but also Cindy. I'm just this is just one of those other uh, other explanations, awareness of where the the name comes from. But it was it was really uh, with the what was the name of the ta- of this the city from 900 BC, Mohenjo-Daro. That's it, Mohenjo-Daro, which was a really a a, a, a Hindu major uh, Hindu town in uh, nine nine hundred BC, a thousand uh, a thousand BC. That's uh, an, another place with a another another origin story of the of the name for uh, name for India. Uh, I just toss that out, Dan. It's yeah, that's one of those things that somebody might might say, oh yeah, that's what I heard too. So. Uh, well, we're, have, we, have we covered Afghanistan? Yes, we have. And we're out of time, and uh, we will talk to you gentlemen next time. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.